The time of reform in China came fast. Led by Mao, the People's Liberation Army stood up against the past government of China, and the Kuomintang, handicapped due to many factors like the past Japanese occupation, fell. In only a few years, centuries of history was overturned as the communists took over completely in 1949. For many, this was a time of hope, and a time where rich landowners no longer had dominion over impoverished peasants. But unfortunately, this revolution resulted in many horrible things as well. Hunger, friends and family fighting one another, the expelling of traditional culture, and the imprisonment of anyone even slightly suspected of being a capitalist. It was a very complicated time, and one that To Live focuses on. To Live is a story about a man named Shu Fugui, and his life before and during the reign of Mao. He gambles everything away, unknowingly saving himself, and lives his life throughout the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. He loses family, yet always recovers. Though both the book and the movie are somehow different, this is the pattern they follow. This is To Live. Compared to the movie, the book is a far darker and unforgiving story, as it isn't simply his son and daughter that die, but his wife, son-in-law, and even his grandson as well. Despite this sadness, Fugue finally buys an ox and continues to live his life, confident in hope for the future, telling his story openly to a traveler and continuing to live. To Live was published in the year of 1993, written by a man named Yu Hua. Born in 1960, the author had a first-hand perspective on the Cultural Revolution. With both of his parents being doctors and the hospital being close to a mortuary, Yu Hua gained a close proximity to death that truly influenced his work. Though originally going to be a dentist, he turned away after finding a distaste for the practice. Yu Hua has written four other books, Chronicle of a Blood Merchant, Brothers, Cries in the Drizzle, and The Seventh Day. Interestingly enough, three of these four books have a setting that take place during Mao's reign. Chronicle of a Blood Merchant focuses on a cart pusher who sells his blood to give his family a better life from the 1950s to the 1980s. Brothers is about two stepbrothers and their childhood during the Cultural Revolution, and Cries in the Drizzle is about a boy in his childhood during the reign of Mao, from a unique perspective. The Seventh Day is his most recent book, though it is his first to not focus on the time of Mao. What's important about his theming in his books isn't how he writes about the time of Mao's rule, but rather how he uses a humanistic aspect to write about how life was at that time. Yu Hua usually puts his characters in small towns, and makes the entire experience from the point of view of the characters he makes. This almost allows a view of Chinese history through the lens of an active participant. For example, Brothers focuses on two stepbrothers living in the town of Liu. This setting allows the reader to understand how much of an effect the Cultural Revolution had on the average Chinese person. Similarly, Yu Hua commonly uses violence and death in his books, a style built from his experience in the Cultural Revolution himself. And looking at To Live, it's very easy to see this style. Fugue's entire family dies before him, from his mother to his grandson. It seems that Yu Hua's use of violence further supports his view on the Cultural Revolution. To have lived that time from a first-hand experience truly must have had such an impact on him, so it's important that he uses this style to share with the reader the brutal and human experience of Mao's government. Only a year after the book was published, the famous director Zhang Yimou took the job of transcribing the book onto the big screen. Zhang Yimou was born in Xi'an on 1950, and similar to Yu Hua, he also lived through the Cultural Revolution. During this time, he took up amateur painting and photography, and after the Cultural Revolution had passed, he pursued cinematography at the Beijing Film Academy. His debut as a director began in 1987 with the movie Red Sorghum, also debuting himself as one of the fifth generation directors. For Americans, perhaps the most well known of his movies are the movies Hero and The Great Wall. While some of his movies have been criticized, it's no doubt that his directing is very influential and often seen as some of the best. Perhaps his best movie is Raise the Red Lantern, which tells the story about a concubine during the 1920s. However, he is also the director of the film version of To Live. This movie has gone on to become one of the most popular Chinese movies, specifically in the borders of China, as internationally it hasn't performed as well. The movie of To Live has its own additions. 
After Fugue gambles all his money away, he turns to shadow puppetry, an art form that was prevalent in pre-communist China, instead of just farming. These puppets are generally made of leather, and often used to tell the stories of myths and legends. Unfortunately, this practice has been losing popularity in modern times, and as the art form requires a certain amount of proficiency, shadow puppeteers are decreasing in number as well. This movie has more liberties of its own. Jiajin leaves Argue by her own will, as she realizes that Argue's gambling is destroying him and his family. This is in juxtaposition to the book, in which her father forcibly takes her away from Argue. Yoching also ends up dying by being run over in a car, instead of simply dying by a mistake and donating blood. That being said, does this movie manage to reflect the novel well? I think it does. The movie doesn't focus on the other deaths that are present in the book, but it manages to use the two deaths to maintain the themes of the book. But what are the themes? Yo a theme I found to be very prominent in both the book and the movie is the faith in hope. Both the book and the movie are called To Live, which seems almost contrary to the fact that many of Argue's family dies, right? Heck, this seems almost contrary to what the reader would expect from a story in the Cultural Revolution time period. Well, rather than focus on the death of the characters, this story focuses on Argue's living despite all of the misfortune he faces. I think one quote from the book shows this in a way. Lost in thought, I dragged myself forward, but when I passed an elm tree, it took only one look for me to realize that I had not the slightest inclination to take off my belt. I didn't really want to die, I just wanted to find a way to punish myself. Argue, despite his sadness, turned towards life instead. Now, was this in order to keep hope for the future? That's debatable, but it does indeed show Argue's desire for life. Similarly, when Chuansheng asks for forgiveness one more time from Jiajun and Argue, after he's deemed a capitalist and plans to commit suicide, Jiajun stops his plan by telling him he owes a life, and that he should live in the stead of Yoqing towards a future. Ah,再怎么着，你也得忍着。你可不能再走这条路了，啊！乖乖，我不想活了。你不想活也得活。咱俩可是从死人嘴里爬出来的，活下来不容易，啊？你知道吗？ I find it inspiring seeing these themes, but there is indeed a darker theme in the story, primarily the Mao government and its early reigning years. I think the movie's reasoning for involving shadow puppetry was because of how old and integrated shadow puppetry was in the culture of China. It becomes a tool to show how the new government took to running the country, first accepting it, then completely throwing it away in defense that the old culture of China is what's holding its evolution back. But of course, we know that this isn't the only change in the Cultural Revolution. In the movie, we see many people like Chuansheng and the village chief branded as capitalist very easily, not unlike how many Americans were branded as communist in the Cold War. This is, yet again, representative of the reign of Mao, yet rather than from a viewpoint of a history book, we can see it from the first-hand perspective of Ar Gui, who sees his own friends put into prison for unfair crimes that they didn't commit. Of course, we see there are happy times, like early after the Mao government is installed, or at least seemingly happy times. There is no doubt that the movie shows Yoqing's death in contrast to that. Because of overwork, Yoqing is killed, and not just overwork on the level of students, but also on the level of district chiefs. So then, how can this story have conflicting themes? 
hope and living on one hand, and corrupt leadership and hurt on the other. Well, I think the story doesn't just leave it at that. I think eventually, on a grander scale, it all turns back to hope. Yuhua and Zhang Yimou, I think, focus on more than just the individual aspect. I think they focus on the entire Chinese aspect as well. After all, both these people survived through the Cultural Revolution. After living through such an era, I think they understood what the character Argue understood as well, that life will always get better, even in darker times. In all the harm that the government of China caused in the Cultural Revolution, it was imperative that those who lived through it had to live. They couldn't just stay in one place and sink into despair, they had to continue living in order to keep the Chinese people going, and soon, find a time beyond the destruction of Chinese culture and the imprisonment of their own people. I find that Argue is a representation of those who live, and have the ability to pass on their knowledge to the younger generations. Here's a good quote from the book to show this. I imagined that this rich flourishing land was full of people like Fu Gui, and in later years I did meet a lot of old men like him. They wore their pants just like he did, with the crotch area drooping down near their knees. The wrinkles on their faces were filled with sunlight and dirt, and when they smiled at me, I noticed only a handful of teeth left in their empty mouths. Although they would often cry, it was not because they were unusually sad. Sometimes they would cry even when they were happy and perfectly at peace. Their hands were as coarse as a dirt road. Raising their hands to wipe away their tears from their eyes was as common a gesture as flicking a piece of straw off one's clothes. Yuhua is connecting Fu Gui to many other old men to show that the experience isn't limited to one person. Instead, Fu Gui is simply an example of the Chinese people who continue strong in modern day past the Cultural Revolution. And in all fairness, the time afterwards got better. Life got better.羊长大了就变成了羊 this time of reform came fast, and out of a dark period came those who lived and wrote about it. Yuhua created a book that didn't just provide a lens to the reader about the past, but it even helped influence the contemporary culture of China, which may be the reason why the government unbanned it after the book was banned. In a time of uncertainty, where freedom in China is sometimes inhibited, Yuhua provided a book that let people understand the past from an individual citizen's perspective, and how those who are older have endured many hardships. And it's thanks to Zhang Yimou that the story has an even stronger prevalence in the country. In a culture as lush and a history as large as China, contemporary stories such as To Live provide a new look at modern China. As we have so many famous dramas and books that focus on a time in the distant past, Yuhua's book was perhaps one of the first to create a story focused on the unbridled history of China's change of government. And though it may seem very depressing, we can no doubt see that Yuhua's answer to this isn't to die but to live. To continue living and moving on to better times, no matter how horrible things may seem. So let me end this video by paraphrasing Fu Gui, that their family is like a little chicken, and that chicken will grow into a goose, and that will turn into a sheep. The sheep will turn into an ox, and soon life will get